praising the Lord we are praising God for his goodness we are praising God for his mercy we are praising God for the good things that he has done for us we are praising him for his salvation we are praising him for the receiving of the Holy Spirit we are praising him for all the good things let us lift up our hands and say praise the Lord God bless you at this time this time we're going before the Lord in prayer I'm going to ask Minister Marvin Maynard to lead us to the throne of grace we have many many names on this sick list here some people are ill some are having trouble in their homes some are having difficulty on their jobs others are having problems in within themselves many many names here we're going to ask him to lay hands on these names the Lord knows exactly who they are let us pray earnestly that the will of God will be done in our lives and as you know we are getting ready to build a new church for God we are going to begin construction on this church on July the 5th, 1989. We're going to pray that God will be with us as we move forward in the name of Jesus. We want to bring our church together. This is our second service this morning. The first service is almost as full as this one. We got to bring our people together. So we're not worshiping one, worshiping at 9 o'clock, another worshiping at 11.30. We want to bring us together that we may enjoy the praises of God together. And let us pray that some soul here today, I mean five souls are baptized this morning in Jesus' name. Let us pray that others will come forward today after this service and receive the Holy Spirit. God bless you, Brother Mena. Let every heart pray. Our Father God, we thank you, Lord, for your faithfulness to us. We thank you, Lord, how you have woke us this morning of sound mind, spirit, and body. We thank you for your love, your mercy, and your grace, but oh, hallelujah, we thank you most of all for dying in our place that we might have a right to the tree of life. We come laying hands on these names, Lord. You know each and every person on the prayer list. We ask that you bless them, that you strengthen them, that you encourage them, that you meet their needs according to your will. We pray, Lord, for your blessings upon this great congregation as we stand before you. We intercede in their behalf, Lord, asking 
that you move in a special way, that you touch their hearts, that you encourage them, that you uplift them by your mighty power. We pray, Lord Jesus, for those who were desired to be here but were unable to come. We pray for those who in our TV audience who are listening. Pray that you bless them and that you meet their needs. We pray for the man of God today as he prepares to bring the word of God, that the anointing be upon him and be upon the words that he speak. We pray for someone who is here and know you're not in the pardon of their sin, that they might come, be baptized in your name, and your promise to fill them with the Holy Ghost. We commit this service to thee. We pray for every auxiliary in this church. We pray for the building spine, especially, Lord, that you might bless your people to meet their needs according to your riches and glory. And so we commit this service to thee. We commit ourselves to thee, asking that you bless the service, asking that you guide and direct it by your spirit. These and other blessings, we ask it in the great name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, we're going to thank you in advance in Jesus' name. Amen. Our scripture reading for today is found in the 10th chapter of the book of Hebrews, verse number 39. Will the congregation please repeat after me? But we are not of them who draw back unto perdition. But we are not of them who draw back unto perdition. But of them that believe to the saving of the soul. Amen.
Let the church say amen. amen. What a beautiful selection. I certainly have been inspired by the singing of our choir today, and I just want to mention the fact that I'm glad to see uh, two of our members who moved to another state because of the job transfer, Brother and Sister Bates. Brother, I'm glad to see Brother and Sister Bates this morning. It's a real blessing to have y'all back in our midst today. Why don't y'all stand up? I want to, hey man, this is the two of our fine, fine young men and women. Praise the Lord. God bless you, Brother and Sister Bates. Glad to have you back with us today. They're, they're doing a wonderful job where they are, I believe in Kansas City. And the Lord is blessing them. And I talked to that pastor and he, he practically tells me that they are the foundation of that church over there. And uh, they're doing a wonderful job. And they, they are uh, carrying with them uh, the spirit of this church. Uh, they were born here. And the spirit of this church is with them. And, and wherever they go, the spirit of the Apostolic Church of God will go with them. We're glad to have you back with us today. We're very glad to have our very fine visitors all the way from, from Sweden. It's a real blessing to have you here with us today. We're glad to see you. When we were standing up clapping, I noticed a large number of, of them, of that group stood up and clapped with us. And they, they were, so they're actually right into the service with you, with us. So we're glad that you are sharing in this service. Now, I'm going to call your attention immediately to the word of the Lord. I'm going to ask you to open your Bibles and turn with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 3 to 5. And I have a subject today, and it, it's really not a subject because it's what I preach every Sunday, but it is a subject too. It's called Christ our Savior. Now, that's my subject. Uh, but I preach Christ all the time. I remember when I first received the Holy Spirit over 41 years ago, uh, I went to church at Christ Temple. And uh, the preacher there, uh, he was an interim pastor, and he preached, on, he preached from, from uh, I believe, from Deuteronomy, or like Second Kings or somewhere. And it took him a long time, uh, but I didn't know anything. So when, when I got home, my wife asked me, she said, what, what, what did the preacher preach on? I said, well, he preached on Jesus. He said, well, what else? I said, well, I don't know. He, just, he, just, he talked about the Lord. And uh, that stuck with me for 41 years. I didn't know. I just sat there and listened to the brother drone on. And uh, he said, well, he talked about Jesus. Well, that's all I want to talk about this morning. That's all, that's all I want to talk about any time is the Lord Jesus Christ. In 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 3 to 5, I want to begin reading. But if our gospel be hid. It is hid to them that are lost. In whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not. Lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. For we preach Christ but we preach not ourselves, but Christ Jesus the Lord and ourselves, your servants, for Jesus' sake. My thought is really taken from verse 5. For we preach not ourselves, but Christ Jesus the Lord. This, I believe, should be a guide, a guiding light, a sign for all of us preachers and for anyone else, really. We preach not ourselves, not what we wear, not where we went on vacation, not our beautiful family, not our cars, not our personal experiences, although our personal experiences sometimes are valued while we are preaching Christ. But we preach not ourselves, but Christ Jesus the Lord. 
The Bible is for us the word of the Lord. The Bible speaks of the whole circumference of things that pertain to life and godliness. There is nothing in the material sense or in the spiritual or moral universe that does not come under the Bible's authority. Nothing. The central theme, the central figure of this entire Bible is Jesus Christ. Now there are a number of other things that are involved and our theologians have sought to break the Bible down into varying divisions so that we can better study it. We've got the first five books of the Bible called the Pentateuch and then we have the, the history of Israel, the division of Israel into the northern and the southern kingdoms, the, the kings of, of the northern kingdom, the kings of the southern kingdom. We, we've got the, the books of poetry, the Psalms, the, uh, the Proverbs. We've got uh, the major prophets, the minor prophets. We have all of these things wrapped up in the Old Testament. And these men are guided by generally the law of Moses, the law that God gave at Sinai. But all of the law, both the moral and the ceremonial law, Paul said all of it was a schoolmaster to bring us to Christ. The New Testament, for purposes of study, also has been divided into various divisions. Biography, the Gospels. History, the Acts of the Apostles. The Pauline Epistles, those epistles written by Paul. The General Epistles, James, 1st and 2nd Peter, 1st and 2nd, 3rd John, Jude, etc., etc. Prophecy, the Book of Revelations. They have been divided up. But all of them, the New Testament, the Old Testament, everything points to that one central figure who is Jesus Christ our Lord. The New Testament teaches us very clearly, ladies and gentlemen, that Christ is the source and the giver of salvation. Christ. As I stand behind this desk, I want to elevate Christ. The Word of God speaks to us and tells us that He who was in eternity, He who in eternity dwelt in the form of God, took upon Himself humanity and burst into human history as a man. And as a man, he was the supreme revelation of God Almighty. Paul writes in the sixth verse and says, For God who commanded the light to shine out of darkness has shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. He is the manifestation of this great God who fills all space and all time. And because Jesus Christ is the author and finisher of our faith, it is easy to see why the principal theme of the apostles' preaching was Christ Jesus and him crucified. We preach not ourselves, said Paul, but Christ Jesus the Lord. And ladies and gentlemen, when I think of him, and I'm trying to, I'm trying to get a better vision of him. I'm, I'm trying to, to see Jesus in such a way that all fear and all anxiety and trouble and worry will vanish. Because we know who he is and, and what he means to us. And as I travel uh, through this uh, journey in life, uh, I see him 
as my Savior. I see him as, as your Savior. I see him as our Savior. I see him as my strength. I see him as your strength. I see him as our strength. I see him as my help. I see him as your help. I see him as our help in the time of need. And when I get a vision of Christ, when I know what he did and the price that he paid, when I know that his work is efficacious, when I know that Jesus did nothing in vain, when I realize who he is and what he did, then his words take on a deeper and more profound meaning to me when Jesus said, I know my sheep and they shall never perish. When I think of that, uh, it seems like I get the chills go all through me. To know that I belong to God, that I am one of the sheep of his pasture, to know that he died for me. And as I gaze upon Jesus with my spiritual eyes, I see him as one who has all power. And I want to say that to some of you who are here without Christ today. As I said earlier, we baptized five in Jesus' name this morning, and I, I'm hoping we're going to baptize more when this service is over. I want you to understand that who, who we are serving and, and who he is to us. He is not someone dead in the grave. He is a risen Christ. He is a Christ who has ascended on high. He is a Christ who stands at the right hand of God. He is one who has sent back the Holy Spirit. You felt his presence here this morning as our choir was singing and the Spirit of God began to move in our own hearts and souls. I see him as one who has all power. Not some of it, but all of it. He met Satan. He defeated Satan. He defeated him not in a pleasant garden, but he defeated him in the waste howling wilderness. I have tried over the years to, be, to remain faithful to the message that God has given to me to preach Christ and all of his power and his glory. But I believe that the image of Christ has been neglected in favor of a more benign and soft-hearted personality. But I must confess, ladies and gentlemen, that I, I see Jesus differently than most of the artists who have painted his portrait. I can understand the problem because we don't have anything to, to paint him. With, so these men, they paint Christ as they see him. There's no pictures of Christ, so a man must use his own imagination. And some of these artists have been brought up in a religious background and tradition that shows Jesus in a very benign and soft-hearted way. But if I was an artist, and if I could take a painter's brush, if I could be a Michelangelo, my conception of Jesus is different. Oh, I don't mean to say that there are quite sure that many of us really fully understand how bruised and battered. Oh, we, we read in the New Testament that they smote him or they took some wreaths and hit him. But, but we don't really get the picture. This wasn't just a little smoke. When those Roman soldiers struck Christ, they took their fist and rammed it into his face. Those of you who sometimes think about Christ, you can hear the blow as it struck him. As our Lord stood there, you can hear them mock at him and hear those big Roman fists ramming into his face. Isaiah prophesied about it in the 52nd chapter and the 14th verse. And Isaiah in his prophecy said, his visage 
was so marred more than any man and his farm more than the sons of men. In my studies of that passage of scripture, I ran across two different translations of that same passage. And one translation reads, they shall see my servant beaten and blooded, so disfigured one would scarcely know he was a person standing there. Another translation says, his appearance was so disfigured beyond that of any man and his farm marred beyond human likeness. That's the way Isaiah saw him. That's why I don't take issue with the painters and artists. But I wish there would be more who could see him like John saw him. But John saw not a bruised and battered Savior, but John saw a risen Christ. John said, I was in the Isle of Patmos uh, on the Lord's day, and I was caught up in the Spirit, and I, I saw the Lord. I, I heard a voice behind me. Like a voice of many waters. I turned to see who it was that spoke to me, and I fell down on my knees. I saw him, his hair was white like wool, his eyes were like a flame of fire. His feet was like shining brass burning in an oven. He was walking in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks and he had seven stars in his right hand. That voice said, I am he who was dead, I am alive and all power. Was in my hand. Paul saw this risen Christ on the Damascus Road, and the historian Luke says uh, that he saw such a blazing uh, and dazzling light, and historians Luke said it was brighter than the noonday sun. And Christ has taken all that suffering. Christ has taken that awful cross, and he has turned it into a glorious throne of power. Jesus, born in Galilee, a small village. He wrote no books, he led no armies, he fought no battles. Yet he has brought down empires and he has changed the course of human history. And above all, ladies and gentlemen, he has laid hold of the souls of men. He has taken wasted lives rotting with sin. He has broken the chains of sin and he has set the captives free. I'm telling you what Jesus can do. My heart is heavy. When I know what's going on in the world today. I was driving down the street the other day and I saw men standing in line, broad open daylight, while the drug dealers were dispensing drugs. And these men were standing in line like they was at the A&P. They weren't hiding, they weren't ducking, they were in line, lined up, waiting for that drug that is sapping their strength, sapping their mind, sapping their energy, sapping their intellect. Men who turn to cocaine, turn to heroin, turn into crack because life does not seem to have any promise. It's a terrible thing to men and women to turn to narcotics when life holds no hope, but there is a hope in Christ. There is something different. You don't need to turn to crack. You don't need to turn to heroin. My God, men lining up. The devil has blinded their mind. Men laughing at you because you go to church. Men criticizing preachers and talking about their racketeers. Men laughing at people who go to church while they themselves are lining up in the street, spending their hard-earned money day after day, three or four times a day, getting dope to put into their veins and into their bloodstream. It's enough to make you cry. Men who won't work, men who spend all their money if they do work on dope, narcotics. You brothers who are here in the church today, you ought to be shouting and jumping up and knocking down chairs and jumping through windows. God has 
delivered you. Jesus Christ has come to your rescue. Praise God. We ought to be praising God. We preach not ourselves, but Christ. Christ. He's the answer. And I can't be too critical. I'm not denouncing anybody. I, my heart is heavy to see black men instead of lining up to get jobs. They're out there lining up for dope. My heart is heavy. I'm not criticizing anybody because we're not for the almighty, matchless, wonderful, tremendous, irreplaceable, immortal, dazzling, glorious, exhilarating grace of God. I would be out there. The only reason I'm not out there is because of the grace of God. The only reason you're not out there is because of God. It's because of Jesus. Oh, I praise God for the church. The church, it stands supreme. The church, it stands strong. Let folk criticize it. Let the demon reign. Let the devils howl. But the church of Jesus Christ will stand firm in the midst of everything else. I said men, I said men, I am, I am surprised how many women are locked into the same thing. Women who've been led into drugs. Women who are losing their families. Women can't take care of their children. Women having babies, carrying babies. on crack. Yeah. Poor little babies coming into the world, yeah. shaking and trembling. Yeah. They are drug abusers before they even get here. They on crack, don't even know what it is. Little babies, little babies. Oh, ladies and gentlemen, I tell you, we can't talk about nothing but Jesus. Somebody said, well, why'd you get off on that? I got off on that. I didn't get off on anything. I started talking about it because I want to try to show some kind of a relationship to what it means to be with Christ and without him. I'm trying to show you that there are people in this world who need Jesus and if we were preaching Christ more, many of them would come to Christ. Not all of them, but a lot of them. And I tell you that when Jesus comes into your life, he'll change that. You look at our congregation, you look around, you see all these beautiful men and women, but you don't know how many of them, when they came here, they was on crack. You don't know how many of them lived for it, but when Jesus Christ came into their lives in the person of the Holy Spirit, he took their lives and turned them around. I've talked with them, I've seen them, I, with the tears streaming down their face. I, they've called me up in the night and the night, Bishop, I need some help. I've tried my very best to help them. We've got members in our congregation who are trying to help them. Ladies and gentlemen, but I'm not only talking about crack now, but I'm talking about a lot of other things that's coming into our lives that we need God for. But narcotics is not the only one. That's just one of them. That's the score that's inundating our country today. But there's a lot of other things that we need to get a hold of. There's some folk who don't want to come to Christ because they say, well, I had to give up my boyfriend, I give up my girlfriend. Well, you don't have to give up your boyfriend, your girlfriend, but you sure got to stop living with them. <laughs> Nobody said because you got saved, you had to give up your boyfriend or your girlfriend. Uh, how are we going to get married if we give up our boyfriends and our girlfriends? Amen. But you sure got to stop sleeping with them. Yes, Nothing wrong with that. Some folk think there's something wrong with it, but ladies and gentlemen, there's nothing wrong with it. The problem we have in today's society is that we are loose, we are promiscuous, we tolerate everything. You can turn on your TV and things jump off of your TV screen that I never thought I'd live to see in life. When I was a 17-year-old, what we saw, what we see in our living rooms, we used to run around in back alleys and uh, open up those Popeye and olive oil books. You young people don't know nothing about that because, see, y'all can, can look at it on TV. But Brother Lee know what I'm talking about. That brother there, he know what I'm talking about. We used to all look at them. We'd grab them little pop out of our books and get over in the corner and look out because our mother's from so they'd snatch them out of our hand and we'd get a good beating. Not a whipping, not a spanking, 
we got a good beating. That's what we call it back in those days. Of course, it's, it's child abuse today. Yes, <laughs> Nothing wrong with whipping children. Listen, my mother and father whipped me. My father never did. I'm sorry about that. My dad never did. My mother did. And I never had a scar on me. My mother never hit me with a stick. I never had a scar. But I got whipping. In fact, if, as I look back, my mother's whipping never did hurt me. But I was screaming and hollering like they were. Oh, you thought, man, she was killing me. But she wasn't hurting me. Uh, who ever heard of you? I got a whipping with a, with a hot water bottle one time. <laughs> How you gonna hurt somebody with a great big old hot water bottle? You just hit me with the hot water bottle all on my leg and I'm screaming and hollering. Oh, you're killing me. Oh! <laughs> I ain't hardly feel nothing. But what she was showing was that my behavior was unacceptable. And sometimes little children need a little spanking, a little, little tap every now and then to help them and to pull them along. Let them know what can be done and what can't be done. Nothing wrong with that, ladies and gentlemen. We need to talk about a little bit more morality in our lives. But above all things, I need to talk about Jesus Christ. Because Jesus, Jesus Christ rose again almost 2,000 years ago and today in 1989, moving on toward the year 2000, we are still baptizing people in the name yes, of Jesus Christ. We are still praying to our Father in heaven in the name of Jesus Christ. Paul said, whatever you do in word or in deed, do it all in the name of Jesus, giving glory to God and the Father through him. Jesus today, Jesus tomorrow, Jesus forever. He is the one who died. He is the one who rose. He is the one who's coming back again. He is the one who sent the Holy Spirit. Jesus. And as the songwriter said, Jesus, Savior, pilot me over life's tempestuous sea. And I love the name of Jesus. It is the greatest name. At the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God. My friend, Christ is your Savior. My friend, he said, Jesus, if I be lifted up, I'll draw all men unto me. He came and died for you. And I want to quote John 3.16 right now. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should never perish but have life everlasting. God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world but that the world through him should be saved. The door of the church is open, brother, sister. There's a man or woman here today who said, Lord, I want to be saved. Will you rise from your seat right now? Come down these aisles and God will reach out and save you. Are you here today? I'm coming down to meet you. If you are here, my friend, will you rise from your seat right now? Where are you? Where are you? I am coming down to meet you now. We are praying now for somebody to say yes to God. Where are you, my friend? My, God bless you there. There's a young lady over there. Where are you, my friend? Is there someone else? Is there someone else? Someone who needs Christ. You may be in the balcony. God bless you, my brother. It takes a little time, it takes a little time, it takes a little time, it takes a little time. We're waiting for you. We are waiting for you. We are waiting for you. Is there another man, another woman here who say, Lord, I want to be saved. There's a young man coming down on that side. Some of these people are coming from the overflow. Some are coming from the overflow over in the dining room. They've heard the word. The Lord is touching hearts. We are waiting for you, my friend.
Is there someone else? We're getting ready to close now. We don't want to close without you. We don't want to close without you. Is there someone else before we close? Before we close. blessings upon you. We're going to ask Brother Jones to come and lead us in prayer. It's your sweetest visitors. No, I didn't. Our Father and our God, it is again your people come to worship you. Lord, we ask you to bless right now. Oh, Father, Touch we thank you. Touch and strengthen somebody. Somebody needs you like never before. Oh, God, we ask you to touch and deliver. Set the captive free. Lord, in your name, Jesus. We ask your blessings now. Someone's home is disturbed. Lord God, we ask you to touch right now. Someone's sick in the body. Lord, we ask you to heal right now. In your name, Jesus. Touch somebody. Lord, we ask you to touch that boy, that girl that's on that cottage. Lord God, send them your way. In your name, Jesus. Like your way round. Strengthen somebody. Heal somebody. Oh God, in your name we ask it. In your name, Jesus, we pray and glorify you. In Jesus' name we pray. Thank God. Amen.